Okay, we're going to talk about the physiology of the stomach at the end of each slide commentary. Please press the right arrow to move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, let's quickly go through the different regions of the stomach. In our cardia and pylorus region, uh, we have cells that secrete mucus. In our body, in our fundus region of the stomach, we're going to secrete our hydrochloric acid, our intrinsic factor from our parietal cells. And then chief cells in this region also secrete pepsinogen. Um, and what happens is that you'll have several sort of gastric glands, and these, this bunch of glands will often share a common opening, referred to as the gastric pit. And the epithelium in between the pits secretes mucus and bicarbonate. Furthermore, there are cells called argentafin cells, or enteroendocrine cells in the fundus, and uh, they make serotonin, called argentafin because they take up silver. Uh, G cells in the pyloric region produce gastrin, and D cells secrete somatostatin, and with then somatostatin inhibits gastrin. Okay, let's clarify what I said in a previous slide. As I mentioned, the cardia and the pylorus have mucus secreting cells, whereas our fundus and our body have parietal cells and chief cells um, to make intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. And then scattered through the body will also be your argentafin uh, and your gastrin secreting and somatostatin secreting uh, cells. Okay, so the stomach secretes juice and uh, secretes about two and a half liters of this juice daily and this juice uh, contains enzymes, it contains mucus, intrinsic factor, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphate, sulfates and hydrochloric acid. And uh, the function of the hydrochloric acid is to activate pepsin to damage uh, bacteria that you uh, swallow uh, along with your food and to stimulate bile flow. Okay, so we know that the stomach makes acid, and that acid breaks down food, but why does it not break down the stomach? It doesn't break down the stomach because of something called the mucosal barrier, which consists of bicarbonate ions, a protein called mucin, and uh, they form a mucus, which pr uh, makes a coating on the inner lining of the stomach, and literally keeps the acid inside the lumen and prevents direct contact between the acid and uh, ep gastric epithelium. So cells in the gastric gland, the neck uh, and the surface cells of the gastric gland, uh, which you'll see in the next slide, they are the ones that secrete the mucus and the bicarbonate ions. Mucus is made of mucin, which is a glycoprotein. Uh, it forms a gel-like uh, substance, which coats the inner lining of the stomach. And this gel-like substance also traps these bicarbonate ions within itself. So although uh, because of all the acid uh, inside the stomach lumen we have a pH of 1.0 to 1.2, because of this mucosal barrier and all these bicarbonate ions are trapped um, and because the hydrochloric acid is kept on the luminal side and away from the epithelial lining, at the epithelial lining our pH is more like 6.0 to 7.0. But now we know that hydrochloric acid is made in the gastric glands. So how on earth does the hydrochloric acid get from the gastric gland through the mucosal barrier into the gastric lumen where it's supposed to be? Well what happens is that we have little channels, little tunnels that form in the gel layer. And the hydrochloric acid moves through these tunnels in the gel layer um, from the epithelium into the lumen. Some of this mucus also squirts into the duodenum when the pyloric sphincter opens. Um, and this sort of very um, bicarbonated mucus enters the duodenum along with the acid. And, it and the mucus will then protect the duodenum from the acid um, as it enters the duodenum. And mucus secretion is regulated by prostaglandins and autonomic reflexes. If you think about your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin or brufen, um, they work by inhibiting prostaglandins, 
um, at the uh, site of pain and by that method they actually reduce your ability to feel pain but as a side effect they also inhibit prostaglandins at the gastric wall and the pro there, over there prostaglandins work to increase the amount of mucus you make so you literally reduce the amount of mucus you make at the same time that, that you're reducing the amount of inflammation and pain you're experiencing and that's why people with cr who chronically use aspirin or chronically use brufin can have a tendency to develop stomach ulcers uh, or, gastri or gastritis. Okay, so here's a drawing of a gastric gland from the Art of Copyright edition of Henry Gray's Anatomy. Uh, anatomy of the gastric gland hasn't changed in the past hundred years, so it's pretty much the same anatomy as it was. We have a surface epithelium and neck mucosal cells that secrete mucus and bicarbonate ions. These knobs are parietal cells which make uh, hydrochloric acid. The, uh, these cells are chief cells that make pepsinogen. And the pepsinogen and the hydrochloric acid enter the, this channel. And then um, multiple gastric glands open into a gastric pit. And they enter the um, hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen will enter the gastric pit. And there will be a nice thick layer of mucus here. And there will be channels through the mucus. And the hydrochloric acid will go through the channels into the gastric lumen. Besides mucin and bicarbonate ions, uh, there's also a special type of protein uh, called a trefoil peptide. It's called trefoil because they have free a free loop structure. One, two, three, almost like a, uh, a, a piece of clover, a three-leaf clover. And there are various types of these trefoil peptides, um, and one common characteristic is that they are very resistant to acid whether they have any other function uh, besides giving a, an acid resistant property to the mucus layer is not known uh, but if you uh, in mice if you knock out the genes that make these trifold peptides they will tend to develop gastrointestinal malignancy so whether it's by neutralizing acid or resisting acid or whether it's by some other mechanism uh, they appear to have an anti-cancer uh, property at least in mice Okay, so in our chief cells we have zym things called zymogen granules in the cytoplasm, and these are just basically bubbles full of pepsinogen. And under the influence of gastrin, these granules migrate to the cell membrane, and then through exocytosis they release pepsinogen into the gastric lumen. And this exocytotic process uh, is mediated by phospholipase. Okay, so why do I talk about pepsinogen? Because pepsinogen makes pepsin. So when pepsinogen is activated by hydrochloric acid, we have pepsin, and pepsin breaks down proteins and peptides into smaller amino acids, and therefore this is one of the major functions uh, of the stomach to break down proteins. Let's go into more detail on how hydrochloric acid is made. To make hydrochloric acid we need carbon dioxide, which in any case is a metabolic waste product uh, that is quite um, abundant in the body, especially if you stop breathing or if your uh, ventilator fails on a patient that uh, you've doped as an anesthetist, this will rise quite alarmingly quickly. And water, which hopefully you also have ab in abundant levels in the body. And these are absorbed by gastric uh, gastric cells in the wall of the stomach and they are combined to make carbonic acid through the activity of carbonic anhydrase. And this carbonic um, acid dissociates and makes bicarbonate ions in which um, HCO3- minus and hydrogen ions. Now then we've got this hydrogen potassium ATPase pump in the parietal cells, <coughs> which, uh, I've, as I've mentioned before, are involved in ma uh, making hydrochloric acid. They're going to pump these hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen. So we've got hydrogen ions in the gastric lumen. We've got all this bicarbonate, sort of almost as a waste product, 
but we're still going to need chloride to make hydrochloric acid. So how do we make this um, hydrochloric acid? Well, there's plenty of chloride in the interstitial fluid in between cells. And we've got plenty of bicarbonate ions now inside the cell. So there's something called an antiport, which is almost like a exchange pump. Uh, and chloride is moved from the interstitial fluid into the parietal cell, and bicarbonate is pumped out uh, of the parietal cell into the interstitial fluid. And then um, chloride will diffuse down the electrochemical gradient. There's an electrochemical gradient because we've got all this hydrogen positive charged ions in the lumen and this negatively charged chloride is going to sort of be dragged by the electrochemical attraction towards this um, positively charged ion. It needs a channel though to enter the, the lumen and this channel is activated by cyclic AMP. Now remember, for example, adrenaline increases your uh, cyclic AMP. So um, you shouldn't be surprised that people under chronic severe stress with that little bit of extra adrenaline in their bloodstream are going to make more hydrochloric acid um, due to upregulation of this uh, cyclic AMP, which in turn encourages the formation of uh, hydrochloric acid by encouraging chloride pumping being pumped into the lumen. And that's why people under severe stress, long-term stress, can have heartburn and gastric ulcers. Okay, so we've got the chloride into the lumen, we've got the hydrogen into the lumen. By sheer sure electrochemical attraction, they combine forces and make hydrochloric acid. And uh, then we've got all this bicarbonate in the interstitial fluid around the cells. Okay, so because of this process, something that's unique to gastric venous blood is that there's actually less CO2 in gastric venous blood than in gastric arterial blood. So usually throughout the rest of the body, um, arterial blood is less rich in CO2, uh, but high, very rich in oxygen. The oxygen is then given to the cells, um, and CO2 is absorbed from the cells so that the venous blood is actually oxygen poor and carbon dioxide uh, rich not so in the gastric venous system. Um, not only do you are oxygen poor, but you're also poor in CO2 because all that CO2 has been harvested to make hydrochloric acid. Not only that, but those uh, bicarbonate ions are going to leak into the blood uh, from the interstitial fluid and gastric venous blood is uh, also unusually more alkaline than arterial blood. Usually um, uh, in the venous system you have uh, more CO2. That CO2 uh, does spontaneously make uh, carbonic acid uh, in the blood for water in the bloodstream. So most venous blood will be a bit more acidic uh, than arterial blood, but not so in the case of gastric venous blood. Anyway, if um, when you eat a meal, you have increased acid secretion, and if you generate enough acid, um, you can even generate so much bicarbonate and um, that bicarbonate will make the blood alkaline and you can generate so much bicarbonate that you systemically be, uh, develop more alkaline blood and even the urine can then become alkalinized and this is referred to as a postprandial alkaline, alkaline tide so that is an unusual cause of um, alkaline urine Okay, so we have this acid and we need to make sure we don't make too much acid or that uh, we don't make too little acid. We need mechanisms of regulation of this acid. First of all, acid uh, production is inhibited by our prostaglandins, especially prostaglandin E, uh, which loves being knocked out by aspirin. So you'll probably meet quite a few patients in your career who take grandpa every day and present to you because they're vomiting blood from a gastric ulcer. Uh, because that aspirin also knocks out this inhibitory molecule. Acid secretion is stimulated by histamine, working on histamine 2 receptors. Histamine 2 receptors increase cyclic AMP and in it's almost like adrenaline and that activates 
uh, protein kinases, so the cyclic AMP activates the protein kinases that uh, power the potassium hydrogen pump. And that allows more hydrogen to be pumped into the lumen, which allows more acid to be formed. Medications such as cimetidine and ranitidine are H2 receptor blockers. Uh, they block the activity of the histamine at that receptor and thus are used also as um, medications for the tr uh, treatment of gastritis and they are quite cheap um, as well um, so if, if you go into private practice or if you work in state you might often be prescribing cimetidine and ranitidine as a cheap alternative um, to, your tr to your newer um, uh, drugs that um, uh, reduce acid secretion. Next up is acetylcholine, the main neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. It works on M muscarinic 3 receptors, M3 receptors. Uh, that uh, activity at this receptor increases intracellular free calcium ions. These free calcium ions activate protein kinases. Uh, protein kinases. Kinase means that some movement is triggered, so there's some movement of internal cellular structures and that movement powers the potassium hydrogen pump as well. So that makes sense. The parasympathetic nervous system is used for digestion uh, of your food, so when you're eating and the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated um, due to that food bolus, we're going to uh, then act on these M3 receptors to pump in some um, uh, extra acid. One would think though, um, theoretically, that if you're a chronically relaxed person, um, that you would end up um, generating a lot of acid because of your chronic relaxation and chronic parasympathetic nervous system activity, um, and that you'd end up having gastric ulcers from your chronic relaxation. That doesn't seem to really happen. Um, this acetylcholine activity appears mainly to be uh, reflexive due to your food bolus. So if you're not eating, uh, you're not going to get this uh, increased um, acid production from, uh, from your parasympathetic nervous system, and that's why chronic relaxation doesn't cause stomach ulcers. On the other hand, chronic stress does cause uh, stom uh, stomach ulcers due to adrenaline helping out the cyclic AM, uh, increasing the amount of cyclic AMP, which activates those protein kinases. A hormone called gastrin, secreted by the stomach, also increases uh, calcium ion, uh, ions, so it also increases um, the uh, activity of the potassium hydrogen pump in the same way as acetylcholine. And in addition, um, it works on enterochromaffin-like cells. Now, what the hell are those? Well, those are endocrine cells. They contain vesicles and granules, and they have acetylcholine and gastrin receptors, and when they are stimulated by acetylcholine or by gastrin, they release histamine. And this histamine then works on the H2 receptor. So it's a bit of a roundabout way of getting more increased acid secretion. Alright, so we looked at uh, control of acid secretion at, uh, on a cellular level. Now let's zoom out and look at um, sort of uh, secretion of stomach acid from a more macro level. And we know secretion is regulated by hormones and by the nervous system. So these are neurohormonal mechanisms of the control of secretion of stomach acid and uh, other uh, secretions like pepsinogen. In terms of the neural stuff, uh, we know there's local autonomic reflexes from our cholinergic nerves, from our vagus nerves, and others from our parasympathetic nervous system. And this uh, neurohormonal control of uh, stomach secretion can even be divided into three phases, our cephalic, our gastric, and our intestinal phase. Our cephalic phase starts uh, when we're either thinking of food or chewing food. Our receptors in the mouth uh, will reflexively stimulate gastric secretion. If we're thinking about food, that also increases gastric secretion uh, by increasing vagal activity. And this uh, cephalic phase, this head phase, this mind phase sometimes, uh, is responsible for a third to half of your acid secretion. Being angry also increases secretion, so if you're constantly uh, bitching and moaning and pissed off, uh, don't be surprised if you develop a stomach ulcer. You need to take a chill pill.
uh, or also fear and despair of what to decrease secretion. So if you're depressed, you might start suffering from indigestion because your stomach acid secretion is reduced and you just can't digest food the same way as you used to do. Okay, so from the head phase we go to our gastric phase. Uh, we have receptors again, in the, uh, this time in the gastric muscles. Um, as the gastric muscles are stretched, these receptors activate. These receptors also respond to chemical stimuli, especially amino acids. And uh, these receptors also... What happens is these receptors have fibers that extend to the parasympathetic nerve synapses. So what happens when these receptors are activated, uh, rather than having their own sort of no neural pathway to the stomach cells, they just hijack the parasympathetic nerves that supply the stomach, and they just really just activate the parasympathetic nerves, which in turn uh, increase stomach secretion. We then have our intestinal phase, so our food has gone from our stomach into our intestine, and when we have fats, carbohydrates, and acid, in the duodenum. Uh, the duodenum will inhibit acid uh, secretion and inhibit uh, pepsinogen secretion uh, through neurohormonal reflexes. So these two phases increase stomach secretion and then this phase will suppress stomach secretion. And the exact sort of mechanisms are not quite clear but possibly the peptide called YY. Uh, is the culprit responsible for suppressing that stomach acid secretion. Outside of your neurohormonal mechanisms, there are other um, ways of stimulating acid secretion. Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, will stimulate acid secretion. Um, and then alcohol stimulates acid secretion, which is why alcoholics can sometimes develop burst peptic ulcers. Spices that uh, increase stomach secretion, so especially in the Indian population uh, in South Africa, if they have a high spice diet, they will often complain of heartburn and develop uh, stomach ulcers. And caffeine can stimulate secretion, so excessive use of caffeine on tea um, can uh, cause gastritis and peptic ulcers. Okay, but the stomach doesn't just... Um, make acid to break down food. It also churns and food up and moves food. So we're going to talk about the regulation of gastric motility on this slide. First of all, in order to accept food, the stomach has to relax. It has to become a nice big loose pouch in which food can drop into. So as food approaches through the esophagus, the fundus and the upper portion of the gastric body relax. And this is mediated, mediated through the vagus nerve. Uh, for, uh, through stimulation of receptors in the pharynx and the esophagus. Okay, so the food plops into the stomach, and, and then we have peristalsis, which begins in the lower portion of the stomach, so the upper portion relaxes to let the food in, and the lower portion then uh, does all the fun stuff, like peristalsis. And what happens is that uh, we have some pacemaker cells in the stomach, and they send electrical potentials, through the stomach, and this causes waves of contraction that uh, sweep uh, towards the pylorus, the exit of the stomach. And this is referred to as the antral systole. And these antral systole peristaltic contractions can last up to 10 seconds, and there's about 3 to 4 of them every minute. Okay, so this peristalsis moves the food, but it also mixes and grinds the food. Um, and then, uh, well, by mixes and grinds the food by pushing it against a closed py uh, pyloric sphincter. But this pyloric sphincter, from time to time, will open up a little bit, uh, and small amounts of semi-liquid contents will be squirted through the pylorus into the duodenum. And of note, peristalsis sometimes will occur even if you not having any food in your tummy and these are referred to as hunger contractions and they make those loud embarrassing noises when you haven't eaten for a while. Okay, so let's talk about how nerves innervate the stomach to allow this motility.
I'm not gonna give you any pictures here. I'm sure the histologists are gonna give you lovely pictures of these things, but uh, there are my enteric plexuses in the stomach wall, and those are, uh, are collections of longitudinal and circular smooth muscle fibers. And these guys are innervated by by nerves, and we divide our nerves in two broad groups: our intrinsic nerves, and those nerves that sort of begin and end in the stomach, and extrinsic nerves, those nerves that uh, come from outside of the stomach. And the extrinsic nerves are really is just a fancy way of saying our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So our intrinsic innervation is responsible for stomach contractions. Um, so a pacemaker cell cell might uh, might activate and fire through our nerves and activating my enteric plexuses uh, to cause a stomach contraction. Our extrinsic vagal innervation stimulates secretion uh, as discussed in the previous slides for the activity of acetylcholine and also stimulates contraction. Whereas our extrinsic sympathetic n uh, nervous system innervates innervation will inhibit secretion and uh, inhibit contraction but stimulate sphincter contraction. And as to it will uh, uh, it will reduce the amount of acid made, reduce the amount of the overall peristaltic movements, but uh, increase the amount of movement at the sphincter to force the stomach to empty its load. So you'd think that uh, with chronic stress and you know chronic excitement, you wouldn't get stomach ulcers because you're inhibiting acid secretion. Uh, but over the long term. And then yeah, then have this paradoxical effect of increasing acid secretion, rather, rather than um, reducing stomach secretion. So unfortunately, um, being chronically stressed and excited will, in the long term, increase stomach secretion and cause peptic ulcers. Okay, so let's talk about how the stomach empties itself. Now the antrum. The pylorus and the upper duodenum pretty much act as a unit uh, in terms of uh, gastric emptying. The antrum will contract and that will be followed by pyloric contraction and then finally a duodenal contraction. So what happens is that the antrum contracts usually ag first against a closed pylorus and uh, because it's a closed pyro pylorus the food is mixed and crushed and especially solid masses are crushed. Uh, once the antral contractions are done, the pylorus will then contract, um, which will then squirt uh, liquid matter uh, through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. And then once that's done, the duodenal contraction takes over, which then uh, takes the food away from the pylorus before the pylorus has a chance to relax. And because of that, because the duodenal contraction takes the food away, uh, this helps prevent regurgitation when the pyloric sphincter opens. Okay, so let's talk about the regulation of stomach emptying. We've discussed the mechanism, now we're going to talk about the regulation. And the rate of gastric emptying depends on the food that is consumed. Usually takes about three to six hours for the stomach to empty, but if you have a carbohydrate rich meal, if you eat a chocolate bar, or if you have a plate of pasta uh, with ketchup, your stomach will empty much faster. Closer to the three hour mark, sometimes your stomach might empty in one and a half to two and a half hours. So if you're on call at Kalafong Hospital at two o'clock in the morning, you start getting some hunger cravings and you go to that horrible vending machine and casualties and you get yourself a Coke and a chocolate bar, don't be surprised if one and a half hours later you're hungry again because all that stuff has just uh, just basically went through your stomach uh, within one and a half hours. Protein-rich food is slower to empty and fat-rich food is even slower and it can take up to six hours or even more for a fat-rich meal to be properly digested. And uh, hypothetically, I haven't found any randomized control trials for this, but hypothetically, uh, if you eat uh, enough fat before drinking alcohol, you're going to slow down alcohol absorption because alcohol is mainly absorbed in the intestines. By eating a lot of fat, your stomach will, take s will empty small amounts of alcohol over six hours rather than dumping everything within one hour.
into the intestine. So you're going to absor uh, have slowing down of your alcohol absorption. Uh, you're going to take you. It's going to take you longer to get drunk, and you won't get as drunk uh, because uh, of the slowing down of stomach emptying. Hyperosmolarity in the duodenum suppresses gastric emptying. What on earth does that mean? That means that when there are too few, uh, too well, when there's too little water in the duodenum, too few secretions. In other words, too much undigested food. Uh, the duodenum will suppress gastric emptying in order to have time to secrete secretions and digest all this food and uh, dilute it. Uh, back into a, a hypoosmolar state. That water empties from the stomach in about 15 minutes. Um, so if you're starving a patient for a uh, theater procedure, we want uh, patients to have an empty stomach for theater procedure. Um, so uh, for especially for elective pr uh, theater procedures, uh, if he drinks a sip of water about half an hour before the operation, you don't have to worry that water is probably gone. If he's eaten uh, some food for an elective procedure, we want them to be starved for about six hours uh, to make sure there's no food in that stomach, so when you intubate him, there's a reduced risk of aspiration. Okay, the volume of stomach, uh, stomach contents can remain constant because as food leaves, that volume can be replaced by gastric secretions. So even though you might already be pumping food out after three hours, uh, your total stomach volume might remain constant as uh, secretions continue. Our rates of gastric emptying uh, can be reduced by illness, acute illness or chronic illness, uh, chronic gastrointestinal disease, fear and anxiety. So the chronically ill patient might complain of indigestion um, and, and feel sort of constantly nauseous and is unwilling to eat large amounts of food because that food just fills up and doesn't go anywhere. And in severe illness states, um, your stomach emptying rate might even go above and beyond six hours. I think uh, one article I read mentioned um, a patient whose stomach emptying was reduced to uh, 14 hours, or increased to 14 hours, uh, to just to digest one meal. Okay, so we have the stomach that makes acid, that breaks down food, it turns the food to break it into and liquefy it, and it has pepsin to break down proteins. What else does the stomach do? Well, the parietal cells, besides making acid, also release intrinsic factor, which is absolutely necessary for the absorption of cyanocobalamin, aka vitamin B12. What happens is that cyanocobalamin and intrinsic factor bind with another protein called cubulin, and this complex is absorbed in the distal ileum. That cyanocobalamin is then taken away from the complex and transferred to transcobalamin 2 in the blood and then to the rest of the body where it is used in uh, many metabolic processes, but especially in your Krebs cycle. Young children also have the added ability of, in, uh, of secreting a renin. Um, and renin converts casinogen to casein, and this is found in milk. So it makes sense that young children who are drinking more milk should have an enzyme that can break down milk uh, proteins such as caseinogen to casein. Okay, one more function of the stomach is to vomit, which, the, which is medically defined as the autonomic and reflex mediated forced expulsion of gastric and intestinal contents through your mouth. Okay, and this is often accompanied by salivation, which probably helps to neutralize the pH of that acid. Um, pupil dilation, so you can have a good look at all the stuff you're vomiting out. Sweating, um, and a rapid heart rate. Although these are probably more due to the sympathetic nervous system activity, um, which is required to stimulate that vomiting.
Vomiting is controlled by a vomiting center in your brain, which is actually a loose collection of uh, neurons and ganglions and, um, and bodies in the brain. And they are located in the dorsolateral, that's the top side part of the medulla oblongata, the reticular formation of the medulla oblongata. It's stimulated by uh, input from the vagus nerve and the sympathetic nerve and when that vomiting center um, sends out commands through or sends out efferent output through the trigeminal nerve, facial nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, hypoglossal nerve, the spinal nerve supplying the diaphragm and the spinal nerve supplying the abdomen. And typically this vomiting reflex will start with a deep breath of inspiration, your glottis uh, closes to prevent aspiration to your uh, lungs. Your soft palate elevates so that you don't vomit through your nose. Uh, abdominal muscles contract to increase the intra-abdominal uh, pressure. And your cardiac sphincter and your gastric body relax to reduce uh, any obstacles for that vomit on the way out. And as I said, your intra-abdominal pressure builds up to the point where gastric contents are forced up with the due to the change in the pressure gradient. Okay, so what happens when we take out a patient's stomach? Now is when we do a gastrectomy. First of all, um, we're not going to have any intrinsic factor anymore. So this patient's going to develop vitamin B12 deficiency unless we do some sort of intervention. And usually the gastrectomized patient needs to get a monthly intramuscular injection of vitamin B12. Um, if they are anemic due to their vitamin B12 deficiency, they must even get it weekly. If the patient's allergic to injections or some component of the inje uh, injection solution, um, another option, a plan B, is to give it orally, and you give mega doses orally, and about 1% of your oral intake will still be absorbed passively, even in the absence of intrinsic factor. Note that uh, vitamin B12 is stored in the liver, so only water-soluble vitamin that is stored in large quantities in the body, and you can actually take about two to five years to develop deficiency symptoms uh, before this liver stores uh, de deplete. And the second consequence of a gastrectomy, uh, such protein digestion, is going to be much slower, going to be more difficult because you're not making pepsin anymore. You are still going to have some protein digesting enzymes in your pancreatic juice, uh, so you can still digest protein, um, but it's going to be harder. So gastrectomized patients should divide their protein up uh, in such a way that they eat smaller and more frequent meals. Gastric secretions uh, dissolve iron. It's uh, transforms iron from a, a ferrous to a, oh sorry, from a ferric to a ferrous state. Ferric is 3 plus, that's uh, iron 3 plus uh, positive ion, and uh, ferrous is uh, iron 2 plus positive ion. Uh, 2 plus uh, positive ion form of uh, form is easily, um, uh, easily forms complexes other substances and these complexes are easily absorbable. So if you don't have that acid um, that changes iron from a ferric to a ferrous state um, or allows the iron to change states, it's going to be more difficult to absorb the iron and therefore the gastrectomized patient is very vulnerable to iron deficiency. Stomach, um, without a stomach you're going to end up having two types of dumping syndrome. One dumping syndrome is related to glucose, the other to, to hypotonicity. What happens if you eat a very sugary meal, very carbohydrate rich meal, um, normally that's food that stay in your stomach for three to six hours and be released in small alicots into your duodenum. Uh, meaning that only small amounts of those carbohydrates and glucose we um, send to your duodenum at a time, and therefore you have a gradual absorption of glucose, a gradual rise of insulin uh, 
without a stomach, all those carbohydrates and glucose is immediately dumped into a duodenum, which is, and the duodenum is highly effective at absorbing glucose, so all that glucose is suddenly taken up, you have a very sudden spike of your insula, insulin. With that spike, um, it's, it's uh, somewhat of an overcompensation, there's too much insulin, with a sudden drop of glucose, uh, and then your blood glucose levels enter hypoglycemic levels, minus two hours after a meal and then you have the hypoglycemic syndrome decreased level of consciousness confusion cold sweat um, being the principal symptoms another variant of dumping syndrome uh, without all that stomach juice diluting your food content your meal can enter the duodenum still in a hypertonic state and remember, water can move freely in and out of the duodenum. And uh, if your food is relatively hypotonic and your blood is relatively hypotonic, water is going to move from the hypotonic blood into the hypotonic contents of the duodenum. And you're going to lose water into your intestines. And you can lose so much water, in fact, that you develop low blood pressure. and you can actually have all the symptoms of shock or low blood pressure such as a weak thready pulse, um, dizziness, confusion, decreased level of consciousness and uh, cold sweat. Very similar clinical picture in fact to hypoglycemia. Okay, so let's say you've got gastric outlet obstruction and I've no, it's, um, you can put stuff into the stomach through your mouth but nothing can go from your stomach into the intestines. You're going to end up um, with constant vomiting and you're going to have some pretty predictable metabolic changes from that constant vomiting. And I don't want to give you an impression that um, this, um, these metabolic changes are unique to gastric outlet obstruction. Actually, any patient that has constant vomiting is going to have this sort of predictable, these predictable metabolic changes if you don't intervene uh, to correct them. But you're going to be vomiting and you're going to be vomiting um, acid, you're going to be vomiting the secre uh, electrolyte secretions into the stomach, specifically sodium, potassium, and chloride. And then remember that hydrochloric acid is made by making carbonic acid from CO2 and water, and then you have a uh, free uh, proton and you have a bicarbonate. And that bicarbonate is dumped into the blood, and the proton is put into the stomach. So the body is going to end up generating a hell of a lot of bicarbonate in order to try and replace all that hydrochloric acid you are losing. And that bicarbonate is going to end up in your bloodstream and then you're going to have alkaline blood. And then also eventually you're going to start losing sodium potassium chloride from the bloodstream as it's replaced into the stomach and it's immediately sort of vomited out. So you're going to have what's called hypochloremic, and that's low chloride, hypokalemic, low potassium, hyponatremic, low sodium, metabolic alkalosis with all the metabolic problems associated with those conditions, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail here. Now, as you become alkalotic, um, potassium shifts out of your bloodstream and into the cells. An exact mechanism is uh, still a little bit unclear, but what seems to happen is that hydrogen ions are actually sucked out of your um, cells into the bloodstream um, and then eventually taken up by the stomach. And in order to maintain some of the electrical, the same electrical charge in your cells, potassium is flooding into your cells and out of your um, bloodstream in order to try and maintain the same electrical charge. Which can have quite serious consequences because your heart is quite sensitive to potassium changes and it can develop um, uh, cardiac conduction problems with that hypokalemia. Okay, so that's the initial change. Those are the initial changes. Let's say you continue vomiting and you continue vomiting. Um, the one thing that your body really needs to make sure it has the correct levels of is sodium. Sodium is very important for maintaining um, concotic pressure. And um, if, you, if that sodium if it goes out of balance, um, much of the cardiovascular system will start to dysfunction because of inability to maintain uncomfortable pressure. You can have very leaky uh, capillaries. <coughs> and also there's going to be fluid shifts in and out of various compartments. Um, now, so we're going to try and make replace this, uh, try and preserve the sodium that we're losing. So then sodium potassium pumps are going to activate in the kidneys. The problem is they're going to preserve the sodium, 
while dumping potassium into the urine. And we're already losing potassium here. And we're already having a worsening hypokalemia due to alkalotic sh um, shift. Um, so this uh, can actually end up causing more trouble than it's worth, actually. Because uh, even though we're maintaining our sodium, we're going to start developing problems from the potassium loss. By this point, your adrenal glands will start uh, popping out the stress hormone cortisol. And cortisol, as a side effect, um, increases the activity of these pumps. Okay, so let's say you're carrying on vomiting and vomiting and vomiting. Yeah, um, so you're going to get through all these changes, and the next thing that will happen is that dehydration will set in. You've been losing a lot of sodium, and as I mentioned, you're in a hyponatremic state, and um, your water balance changes, and water starts to shift into the cells out of the bloodstream, which means that um, there's less water in your bloodstream, which means there's less water to be, um, that can be carried around, um, which worsens the dehydration, and also your blood pressure starts to drop. And with that drop in blood pressure, there's a reduce in renal blood flow. And then your kidneys start developing kidney failure, um, secondary to that reduced blood flow. Um, so that reduction in renal function causes a renal acidosis due to uh, inability to get rid of uric acid, lactic acid, and other acidic waste products. The other thing is that the kidneys um, generate bicarbonate um, in response to um, acidity. Uh, and with that reduced renal function, they're not going to be able to generate uh, bicarbonate uh, to compensate for these increases in acid products. By now, you're running out of water, so your stomach is also struggling to make bicarbonate. And then you're going to end up with metabolic acidosis. Now, generally, metabolic acidosis, um, you would look, uh, look at the anion gap uh, on your blood results. And um, there's a very differential diagnosis depending on whether or not there is uh, an anion gap or not. But with this sort of dehydration, um, the loss of the electrolytes, um, you may or may not have a wide anionic gap. So the anionic gap with constant vomiting is somewhat unreliable. So you're going to have stagnant flow of urine as well. So there's very little urine made, so it's uh, and so not as uh, watery, so it slows much slower, and urea is reabsorbed very easily um, by the kidney. The kidney is very good at reabsorbing urea as part of main, um, uh, preserving nitrogen, uh, but in this case it's actually harmful to the body, and you have all this urea. Um, that's reabsorbed, whereas your creatine, as long as there's a little bit of renal function, that creatine is still going to be given off. Um, creatine is a waste product, so you're still going to have creatine in the urine rather than in the blood. And then you're going to have this typical ratio of urea to creatine, where you're going to have about 20 urea molecules to one creatine molecule. And that's important when you're in clinical practice, um, when you're going to do a UNE blood test on a patient, and you're going to see the urea and creatine, you know, those are excreted by the kidneys. The creatine is very high, um, and as high as the urea, um, you know that the kidney function is not working well to get rid of the creatine, whereas if it's only urea that's high, or um, if the creatine is elevated, but um, urea is 20 times more elevated than creatine, um, then you know that the kidney is still able to get rid of the creatine, but there's something preventing uh, the urea from flushing through, and that usually points to dehydration when you've got a ratio of 20 to 1, or um, inability of blood to go to the urea. Uh, kidneys through uh, something like shock. Okay, and with that acidosis, um, hydrogen ions are flooding into the cells and it pushes potassium out of the cells and into the bloodstream, um, which can either normalize the potassium and masks uh, true hypokalemia. So you might not realize the patient is hypokalemic, you correct the acidosis, the patient suddenly develops hypokalemia and goes into cardiac arrest due to severe hypokalemia. Um, for example, um, so that's a potential pitfall. You need to check your potassium levels before and after correction of acid. Um, or you might even have such severe acidosis that you become hyperkalemic, which can, which is in fact is more deadlier than hypokalemia. And then if th this is not complicated enough, uh, not only can you get dehydration, but you can get starvation. And once you have starvation, your fat uh, breaks down and is converted to ketones and ketone bodies are acidic, so you develop ketoacidosis from starvation. In this last slide, I uh, just want to briefly touch on some physiological aspects of bariatric, bariatric surgery.
which is done for our obese patients in order to help them lose weight. There are two um, uh, accepted now modalities uh, for b uh, bariatric surgery, the Roux-en-Y loop and gastric banding. In the Roux-en-Y loop, um, the top part of the stomach is uh, cut off and then attached to uh, the intestine at a halfway point. This uh, causes then a sort of a Y-shaped um, uh, gastrointestinal tract with one loop and being the stomach which is now uh, unattached to the esophagus and that loop um, uh, that uh, duodenal loop then attached to um, uh, the other parts of the small intestine. And this bypasses the stomach uh, so it's almost the same as having removed the stomach completely uh, since the stomach is still present but it's not getting food into it, it's going to become hypoactive um, and uh, it's uh, the equivalent of removing it um, uh, physiologically. Not only that but um, now um, the f food will more speedily um, go through the uh, intestine, uh, small intestine causing a, almost like a short bowel syndrome type picture uh, with mal malabsorption uh, of nutrients. Please um, go have a look at the small intestine uh, lecture and um, I discuss uh, short bowel syndrome in that lecture. Not only that but um, now that a reflex that causes bowel to be secreted um, is uh, somewhat bypassed um, so you're going to have back uh, and initially you're going to have almost a uh, overproduction of bile because there's no uh, stimulus to release the bile so the bile just accumulates and accumulates so uh, these patients can develop gallstones because the bile is never flushed out and they can uh, develop um, malnourishment due to this uh, poor bile secretion of mal uh, poor absorption of fat and poor absorption of fat soluble vitamins uh, and that's discussed uh, also uh, in that lecture uh, on the small intestine the other procedure is gastric banding, where a band is put on the stomach, causing it to um, uh, basically be divided into two pouches. So when you eat that upper pouch, the stomach fills up. And um, typically these patients get more rapid feelings of fullness and satiation as previously. And that's probably possibly due to um, the increased secretion of peptide YY, or when that stomach wall distends um, and peptide YY uh, is secreted uh, when the stomach also, uh, distends and that's, this is thought to be part of the mechanism of uh, that feeling of fullness that you get uh, when peptide YY uh, enters the brain. And 